Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our YouTube series, Interviewing Experts on the Five Senses. I am your Overthink co-host, Ellie Anderson. And for those who maybe haven't encountered the series yet, um, this is part of our podcast series on the five senses. You can listen to Overthink wherever you get your podcasts. But we are pairing the podcast episodes with this very exciting YouTube interview series. And I will now turn it over to my co-host, David, to introduce our guest. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm David. Uh, we are very excited to have with us today Dr. Liliana uh, Levy, who is a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Medicine at UCLA. Uh, she received her PhD in philosophy from Emory University, like Ellie and Woo-hoo. myself. So <laughs> this is a bit of a reunion of, of buddies um, in the context of a professional discussion about the census. <laughs> um, and it, as we know her, Lily uh, wrote an amazing dissertation entitled Contested Illness and Embodied Knowledge on Medical Gaslighting as Epistemic Injustice. Um, and in this dissertation, she foregrounds patient perspectives on medical error, on diagnostic delay, and on illness dismissal to give an account of medical gaslighting as a systemic and pervasive form of epistemic injustice. And now, as a postdoc at UCLA, uh, Lily works uh, on the research ethics of brain-computer interfaces, also known as BCIs, and specifically visual cortical prostheses. And you'll find out what that means in the course of this interview. So, Lily, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Well, thanks so much for having me. A uh, huge fan of the podcast over here. So it's yeah. a delight to be here with you. Yeah, it's so great to have you as our dear friend on the show. And um, I think your work is, I mean, your work is not only amazing, but also working at a really interesting intersection between philosophy and, you know, medical, mm-hmm. the medical field. And so I think you're your career is also really interesting testament to how people with PhDs in philosophy can be doing amazing applied practical work and also the theoretical stuff. So with that, I want to ask you about your work at the lab. You're working at this interdisciplinary lab at UCLA that David mentioned um, that specializes in the ethics of emerging neurotechnologies and human research. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the projects that your lab is currently working on? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a really interesting configuration. We work with a philosopher and a neurosurgeon as the co-PIs in our lab. Um, Ashley Feinsinger is the philosopher and Nader Paradian is the uh, neurosurgeon. And we have two main focuses. Uh, The first is an NIH grant that funds um, an ethics study into the ethics of basic brain research. And so... um, You might think of different kinds of medical research. Some is therapeutic, some is clinical, and some is basic, trying to solve sort of basic scientific problems about how the brain works. And Mm. so the first thing, I'm not as involved with this project, though I do work on it a little bit. Um, The first project was interviewing people who had been um, taking part in uh, intraoperative non-therapeutic basic brain research. So these are people who were getting a brain implant for something like Parkinson's, and then they were asked to participate in non-therapeutic research about like wherever the brain implant was going. So about motion, I think, was what most of these participants were working Hmm. on. So it's it's quite interesting um, because there's a limit to what neuroscientists can learn through non-invasive means. And um, they only have access to sort of the invasive or the, the surgical um, context for people who are already getting surgery for another. Mm. And so as you can imagine, it raises a bunch of ethical yeah. issues um, <laughs> related to consent. And um, yeah, it's quite interesting. But for me, my project has mostly been tied to the uh, this study for a visual cortical prosthesis. And I can tell you a little bit about that technology if um, that's a good place to start. Yes, I think that's great. Yes, since <laughs> this is part of our you know, series on vision or the series on the senses that um, related to the episode on vision. So that would be great. Yeah. And maybe and we, I yeah. want to come back to the ethics too, for sure. Oh, we'll definitely come <laughs> back to that. But uh, yeah, maybe you can also say something about the brain computer interfaces of which then the visual cortical prosthesis is one example. Yeah. So I think it's, um, I mean, there are, 
the category of BCI is kind of broad and there are a number of different kinds of emerging neurotechnologies. Some are um, BCIs for things like speech, like there's the brain gate study. Um, and then there are other sort of newer uses of technologies that have been around for a long time. So like deep brain stimulation has been around for several decades and has mostly been used in patients who have Parkinson's or essential tremor, um, dystonia, but now it's starting to be used in the uh, trials, at least for um, psycho psychiatric disorders. So things like OCD, um, depression, refractory depression, and actually even refractory chronic pain, which is quite an interesting mm. um, one that overlaps with my areas of interest and in dissertation work as well. Because the theory is that like if the DBS is put into the part of the brain that controls affect and emotion, it will have a reduction on the affectivity of pain, um, even if it doesn't reduce the um, nerve sensation of pain, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then the visual cortical prosthesis, it's a little bit different. Um, it's the history of the technology is, is I want to get there. It's, it's really important, in my opinion, to kind of go back and trace out this history, although that's not something that scientists are necessarily always excited to do, because um, I think it just comes from a different sort of disciplinary background where from a scientific perspective, you want to make fine grained distinctions between engineering and different things about the technology. But from a philosopher's perspective, I think the history is quite interesting. And so the proof of concept for these devices really goes back to 1929, where there were two groups of German uh, neuroscientists, uh, one in 1929, one in 1931, who found that if you put electrical stimulation to the occipital pole, um, near the visual cortex, it will produce a perception of light called a phosphine. So it's like a spot of light that kind of hangs. And this was in sighted uh, patients. It wasn't in blind patients when they found this, but then they also found that it worked for blind patients as well. Um, fast forward to 1968, the first prototype was developed um, where they were able to implant an array of electrodes in um, by the way, I think she was 52 years old and she was a patient with acquired blindness. And that sort of showed that if we could make a device that worked to produce these perceptions of light. And then since then, it's been this sort of back and forth with advances in engineering and then sort of theory. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting to see how that kind of staggers. Um, I will say that the sort of underlying theory of how this technology should work is has not quite panned out the way that researchers have theorized. So they've thought that because they can make a single spot of light and then they can make two spots of light, three spots of light, that they would be able to bring those spots of light together into a uh. complex picture that would work similar to a pixel. Um, and unfortunately, there has been very little evidence that this is the case based on these trials. And now what with with the device that um we've interviewed the patients who are um in the trial they found that for both sighted and blind participants there's better pattern recognition when they follow more of a tactile stimulation pattern so instead of mm. putting an image or like a letter a shape or something like that where it's statically stimulating all of these different phosphines if they trace it out kind of like you would on your palm that produces a more organic kind of pattern recognition, which I yeah. think is really interesting. And, uh, and just blend uh, in between. Yeah. And so I yeah. read a couple, I, I read at least one of the articles that was published by the team in your lab because I just got very fascinated by the subject matter. And so just to clarify, when you say when they put an image or they trace an image like in the hand, you're not talking about the eye. You're talking. You're talking about the cortex, right? You're talking about the brain. Oh yeah. Um, and so it seems like the idea originally was that if you just literally uh, deliver electrical simulation, almost like in a let's say like the letter Z. I think that was one of the examples mm -hmm. that was used. If you just like deliver a Z of electrical energy um, to the occipital lobe, then the patient would see a Z visual pattern right um and, mm -hmm. and then that's not what happened what and and it seems like what they need is the dynamicity of the exactly. movement so can you say a little bit about 
how they came to this conclusion or or just why that dynamic element would be so central to the perception of something as basic as a couple of lines? So I don't know how they came to that conclusion, mm -hmm. but I think they're sort of iterating it to try to figure out what will work best. And um, so we that that paper that I sent you was published before I came into the lab. So we don't really work with them specifically to the point that I would know exactly why they were trying out these different things. But I think from, um, I don't know, like a, a perception perspective, there's a big question about what this artificial vision is supposed to do and how it would be useful to someone who's blind, mm -hmm. right? Because if it's aiming to be a sort of imitation or replication of natural vision, then it would work through this kind of like immediacy um, but it hasn't achieved that yet. And most of the scientists who work on this are, um, will say, oh, we don't want it to be curative. We're trying to make this kind of assistive technology. And there's a question about how and in what capacity something like this would be meaningfully assistive to a blind person. I think that um, what's interesting is that there's the control group of sighted patients and blind patients, and this was the same. My hypothesis would have been something like, well, um, blind, the blind people who are taking part in these studies are used to having a sort of heightened tactile sense using a cane, using braille, using touch to navigate the world. So I wonder if that has something to do with it. But mm -hmm. as far as the neuroscience of why it's working for the control group as well, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like, th so this is super interesting um, for me. And I want to now, Ellie said we will get to the ethics, and I kind of want to go there right away, um, yeah. because as philosophers, that's where we zoom in often. When it comes to questions of, of technology and science, um, it's not the only place, but it's one of the, it's a common place for this collaboration. And the reason I want, I want to go directly to ethics here is because as the in-house, in-lab ethicist <laughs> um, at, at UCLA, um, you make the argument that this does raise a lot of ethical questions about both the research itself that is being conducted, but also about the use of these brain-computer interfaces more generally, especially in non-therapeutic contexts, right? So when there is a clear therapeutic application, that's one thing, but we're also seeing the rise of these in non-therapeutic settings when maybe it's for, for enhancement um, rather than for cure. Um, maybe that's one way to think about it. So can you talk a little bit more now about what some of those ethical concerns are for you? Sure. Yeah. So I think I might take the second part of your question first mm -hmm. with the enhancement thing. Um, and, you know, you might think about debates in transhumanism, posthumanism. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Fixed. It really yeah. breaks this down in a lovely way. Highly recommend for yeah. students. Um, if, I've if shown it to my students. It's great. Yes. What yeah, is it it's, about? It's a great. It's about the tension between um, emerging technologies that have a lot of hype or sort of like techno optimism uh, around them. And then the reality of assistive technologies and sort of the structural conditions that disabled individuals in this country specifically mm -hmm. face. Um, and this sort of like disjoint mm -hmm. between oh, cool. this fantasy of enhancement, amelioration, and yeah. then the reality of the sort of structural um, social model of disability. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so I think the enhancement thing is interesting. It's not something that is um, happening right now. And it's honestly a question that I was more worried about when I started the project than I am now. Mm -hmm. um, because I think there's this sort of kind of like hype around it where it sounds really amazing. It sounds really sci-fi. And then you learn that it's been happening for a very long time. You learn that it's not really going, um, it's not really at this point where it could be implanted in a person with vision and bring any kind of meaningful enhancement. But I would say the one worry that I still have is, is something like a distributive justice problem where all of this research on emerging neurotechnologies is sort of licensed ethically in our institutional ethics system be, um, 
because of the various illnesses and disabilities that the participants have. So you can't just sign up for one of these studies. And like when I mentioned the control group of sighted people, those are typically epilepsy patients who are yeah. in um, a monitoring ward for about a month who are having, they have uh, doctors who had trouble figuring out what's causing their epilepsy. So they're staying in the hospital for them to figure that out. And they're asked to participate in this kind of trial. So even when um, it's not fully involving blind patients, there is this sort of overarching way in which this research is involving exclusively disabled participants. And so there's a sort of worry about, well, if it does get to the point where it would be meaningfully useful as an enhancement technology, who is benefiting in on the mm. big picture? And is there a... Um, are there are there concerns about that? Um, if it becomes, say, more profitable as an enhancement technology than as an assistive technology, what um, what happens then? Are people compensated for this? And, and how does that sort of fold into the justifications for the research um, as it's being done mm-hmm. now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it also seems um, like there's a bit of a gray area um, between assistive and enhance. Enhansive is that the yeah. <laughs> uh, adjective here? Technology. So I wonder if you could maybe say a little bit about that. Like it seems to me like at the very least, assistive versus enhansive would be culturally dependent, right? Like I'm wearing my glasses right now. I have, I, I have really really bad vision. Um, but like maybe I, if I lived in a society where everything was really close up, I wouldn't need my glasses. That seems like actually a pretty terrible example, of this, but it's the one that was right in front of me because of my glasses. Um, but like a society in which, um, you know, there, there are certain like barriers to access um, because that, that appear as barriers to access because the society is structured in such a way that like certain things are um, expected versus not. I wonder if you could just speak a little bit to that potential gray area. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that gray area definitely exists if you're thinking about a distinction between an enhancement and assistive technology. But it might, if you don't mind, I might reframe that to a sort of long going debate in disability studies about the difference between an assistive versus a curative technology, because I think Mm. that that's quite um, interesting for this case, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're doing something like artificial vision and One way um, that people have made that distinction is by thinking about the mode in which um, the technology is intervening. So if, say, um, the aim is to restore the functioning that has been lost, you can go about that in two ways. You can go about that by restoring the mode, or you can go about that by introducing a new mode Mm -hmm, that would mm -hmm. accomplish the same thing. So the difference between walking up the stairs or using a chair to get up a ramp. Mm -hmm. Um, The assistive technology allows you to meet the same end, but it doesn't um, allow you to do it by the same means or mode. And Mm -hmm. so with this technology, I mean, Joe Romando has a great article that kind of breaks down how BCIs, uh, and including things like cochlear implants and visual prostheses, really blur this distinction. But I think it's, it's at least interesting and helpful when thinking about what the aim of this kind of thing is, are you trying to restore a comprehensive kind of artificial vision? um, Or are you trying to (laughs) create something that's going to be assistive? And if so, what needs to be in place in order to make it assistive? And so for me, I think that there is a real sort of uh, confluence of ethics and design here where Um, the design elements of how these kinds of technologies are developed are really what's going to make it more or less assistive. Um, Mm -hmm. And if that isn't invested in, then um, I think it really might better be classified as a different kind of research. It might be better classified as um, not therapeutic. I mean, that also kind of goes back to this question of, is this therapeutic research? Is blindness a disease that needs a therapy? Um, And how are researchers and also how are participants thinking about that kind of um, question that sort of underlies Mm -hmm. what what this research is trying to do. Um, David, I wonder if you have... Yeah, go ahead, Lil. Oh, I should also mention, I feel like I didn't really describe what these systems look like, and it might be helpful for viewers to understand. Sure, yeah, yeah. So there's four components to it. So the first is um, a pair of glasses that have a camera mounted on it 
So the camera will take in the sort of user's environment. And then there's a video processing unit that the person will carry on their um, body in like a little bag that converts the camera's information into an electrical stimulation. I'm sorry, we're being joined by two cats right now. So if you hear some... <laughs> we'd, we'd, we'd love if they could make an appearance. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're circling my laptop. Um, we'll see. Okay, no, no, if you noise hear a stray meow. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's why it's not oh me. Uh, no, that that's super um, helpful to to visualize, Lily. And I, I was thinking too, yeah. kind of in response to what you were just saying a moment ago about, um, like whether we're thinking about about blindness as a quote disease or not. It's reminding me, David, of some of the stuff that you bring up in our episode on hearing about deaf culture. And I just wondered mm-hmm. if you might have a thought on that for Lily, uh, you know, about like this, this notion of, um, like, it's, it's not that deafness for, for many deaf folks, deafness is not considered, uh, something that they lack, but rather a mode of their, or a feature of their being in the world that actually enables other things. I don't know if you yeah. want to, yeah, maybe add well, that or think so, about it a little bit more. Yes. Um, uh, maybe we can think about this in terms of, um, the cochlear implants because, uh, Lily, you mentioned those and, uh, you know, we know that, um, when you're talking about these kinds of prostheses that, that add to a sensory modality that a certain population doesn't have or doesn't have in the same way, there, there is some controversy around that. And we know that the cochlear implants have been part to that controversy from the standpoint of disability theory and disability activism, because often there is this tension of the makers of the technology, maybe assuming that uh, people with impaired hearing should want a technology that will quote unquote fix their, their disability. And so I know that you have spoken about this in connection to, to your work, disability and, um, uh, disability theory, disability ethics. And I'm just wondering whether there might be similar concerns here about disability justice just in connection to vision rather than hearing. Um, and maybe, I, I mean, I just wonder, in connection to the to the people who have already used this technology, whether they are embracing it, whether they are not embracing it, whether they think, well, this does add something, but in the end, I'm actually better off with other things so can you talk to us just about the disability perspective here? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the cochlear implant analogy is something that we in our lab have been very you know, aware of and concerned with. And I think what's interesting or there are some key differences. So there isn't the same kind of blind culture as there is deaf culture. Um, it's not, there is, you know, when people are worried about cochlear implants, they're worried about the obliteration of a way of life and a cultural community and the sort of deprivation of someone who's born deaf um, not being able to participate in that community because of the cochlear implants, specifically Mm. um, hearing parents making that decision for a deaf child. Um, And what's different about a visual prosthesis is from a neurological perspective, it's only going to work if you were born sighted and have acquired blindness. So there's a key difference there. And I think that the principles of disability justice at least commit us to a certain idea of autonomy and individual choice that would not say, full stop, this technology should not be developed. I haven't Mm -hmm. really heard anyone say that. um, And I haven't, when speaking with various blind people, have never encountered that. So I'm actually, the first study we did was talking to participants in this trial. The second study that we're doing currently is speaking with people who'd be eligible to uh, participate in this research and asking them some sort of key ethical questions about it, their opinions on how this research should be conducted. And one of the questions is about the cochlear implant. And okay. of course, this isn't published yet, but anecdotally, it's a hard question to ask because um, when I ask it, the people I've spoken to at least are kind of puzzled and they're like, why are you asking this? Of course, this research should be done, Um, which was something that surprised me. Um, And I think the uh, acquired blindness poses uh, certain difficulties for participants or for, for individuals um, that, I wouldn't want to minimize. Um, there are big transition costs to it. And um, I, I think that there isn't that same tension, at least, 
speaking with people who are blind. But mm-hmm. I won't, I, I'm not saying that to dismiss any kinds of concerns about disability justice and what, how this work should be um, done. Can you remind me of the first part of your question? Uh, or no, I think the that, second part of your question. I think that was the question about uh, disability justice in, in connection to um, to these implants, to these um, cortical vision prostheses. And then I asked what the response from people is who are potentially being given access to test this technology and whether they are coming to the conclusion that, yes, this is something that I want to integrate into my life. Because I remember from the article that I read from from the lab, it does give people some um, some fun- some actionable kind of visual mm-hmm. information, like seeing lines on the yeah. ground to differentiate like mm-hmm. the sidewalk from the street, or whether people are saying, look, this is interesting and all that, but by now I know how to move through the world in, in a different way, and I don't want to incorporate it. Yeah, that's a really great question too. And so, um, like I said, we interviewed the people who are in the trial, um, and we found something really fascinating that really hits up at that question, which is that there's a, a sort of dissonance or asymmetrical relationship between reported functionality and then reported assessment of benefit. So okay. participants would say, mm. hey, I can do this thing. I can tell where a window is. I can tell where a door is. I can tell where the boundary between grass and concrete is on a well-lit day. Uh, because the technology only really works in good Um, quality lighting with high contrast situations. So they give us all these examples. And I think there's been this assumption on the part of investigators that there's, there's going to be a sort of necessary benefit that follows from any kind of function. So it Mm, would be, mm -hmm. it might not be automatic. There might be a little bit of a learning curve to understand how the technology works, but once that functionality is achieved, it would necessarily be beneficial. Mm. And that's something that from our study we found is not um, necessarily the case that even if say a participant is um, listing all these functions that they can do they might also yes. say the utility of this is marginal or um, I don't assign it you know they, they wouldn't assign it a very high level of overall benefit and I think that oh, really mm-hmm. goes into this question of like what is the relationship between vision and a person's being in the world and is sort of just restoring a little bit of this modality the same thing as giving them something that would really meaningfully um, improve accessibility Mm -hmm. in the world Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and i think it's quite interesting that there isn't um yeah one-to-one relationship Mm -hmm. and in fact um the company that makes this device developed this uh assessment tool called Flora for a different kind of prosthesis that they had um, developed in the past. And it, I think it stands for like the functional low vision observer recorder assessment. Um, I might have gotten that acronym <laughs> wrong, but it's basically a combination of a subjective and objective assessment of a person with low vision um, using one of these devices to kind of figure out how Um, much functionality is coming from the device. And Mm -hmm. what they found is that it's really hard to tell when someone's actually using the artificial vision versus when they're Mm -hmm. using other kinds of assistive um, technologies or other kinds of ways of compensating. Because it's actually, there's a bit of a, I mean, you might extrapolate from this and say, okay, well, there's a bit of a transition cost to adapting to using artificial vision when you have all of these other um, sensory modalities, you're using touch, you're using sound. There have been s- interesting studies about um, height, how people who have gone blind have then developed heightened senses, mm-hmm. heightened like echolocation. Um, and it's, you have all these other ways of navigating the world that you've adjusted to, right. and then you introduce this new variable. And how is that useful? Mm-hmm. Um, is yeah. it useful? Is it going to automatically add value to your daily life or another way to frame it is what is necessary for it to add value Mm -hmm. Um, and the participants themselves have suggestions about this too which is also quite interesting so Mm -hmm. um, because it seems like the idea that there would just be an obvious value to having increased functionality itself is trading on 
ableist assumptions, which uh, mm-hmm. namely the ableist assumption that to be able to see is better than not being able to see. And it's like, well, maybe I don't really need to see the window because I was perfectly fine, like being able to lift the window by means of touch before in order to get some fresh air. Um, but that's also interesting to add in that other component of what you're talking about is that, which is that uh, a subject might not even know which, which modality they're using. And I think that that's probably true for, for a lot of perception is like, we're picking up on cues all the time that we don't recognize. And to be able to say like, oh, I, I, you know, smelled the food before I tasted it. It might be a bit of a, an arbitrary Mm -hmm. assessment. We might not really know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Yeah, it's um I think I think that this research needs more of a sort of phenomenological philosophical perspective on mm. perception in order to um help develop it in a direction that would be more assistive and I think it also needs a greater involvement of participants. And so this is kind of coming back to the ethics Um, I think there are sort of design and ethical sort of mandates for a greater involvement to participants. And so my big thing with this is incorporating user-centered design in this Mm -hmm. process earlier. And so UX design is something that's really common in all technologies that we use, Mm -hmm. like from your credit card to the door handle to... um, you know, your phone to your AirPods. Website Um, functionality. (laughs) Website functionality. And there's a huge sort of area of accessibility in user-centered design that exists and has been um, developed for years. I mean, pretty much since we went online and so much of our world was transacted on the web. Um, But it's not something that really gets brought into technologies that are being developed at this early stage. So the trial that I've been talking about, it's a feasibility trial. It's trying to determine whether or not this thing works, how it works. Um, It's only six participants. So it's it's very small. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Um, tiny. And I think that, and and I'm not alone in this, there have been a number of people sort of in this field pushing for the implementation of this kind of engineering earlier in the process for various reasons, including business reasons and technology reasons, but I think there are also ethical reasons to do it. And it would involve um, sort of engaging participants differently, um, more actively in the research and design process, and then taking seriously sort of the, um, I maybe I would call it being in the world experience of using one of these devices outside of the lab. Because Mm -hmm. right now, the way that um, the research is structured is that the participants will come in and they'll do sort of structured exercises with a technician once a week or once every other week. And that's where the research is really taking place. Earlier on, they would have someone come to the house and help them learn how to use the technology. But at this phase, since it's a five-year trial, they're really just um, more on their on their own in terms of experimenting with it. And I think it could be helpful for future versions or other sort of devices to um, really engage participants in the world differently to kind of figure out what the use of this is in addition to improving the neural interface. Yeah. Well, and, So I think those two yeah. should go hand in hand. Well, especially in light of what you said that some of these participants have actually have very concrete recommendations about what it would take for this functionality to actually take on meaning for them on a practical level and for them for it to be worth it right to be worth the price to be worth the trouble to be worth the re-education of their way of being in the world um and so maybe that's something that we will have you to talk uh, to us again once that research is done because unfortunately we are out of time today uh but lily it has been such a pleasure to have you talk to us about um, this subject and this research and we commend you for your work at this really fun and thrilling intersection of philosophy ethics and medicine yeah thank you so much much go ahead (laughs) 
<laughs> no, I was just gonna say thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's always funny with the Zoom delay. I know. No, I'm I'm so grateful for your time, Lily, and you know that you know as a as a close friend of of ours and a close friend of the pod, it's really a joy to have you on. Um, we're super excited to see where this research goes, and folks, keep an eye out for uh, Lily's publications, some of which you can already read from the lab, and I know some of which are forthcoming. Some very exciting work. Oh, thanks. All right.